Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Good afternoon and welcome to today's INSEED research sharing series. My name is Kashifa Noshi and I'm a PhD scholar at INSEF Malaysia. And I will be your MC for two days uh, for this afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome all of the participants to our sixth INSEED research sharing series. Thank you for joining us in today's session. Uh, before we proceed uh, for the presentation, I would like to remind you a few rules. Uh, as we do in our online session. So I will expect all of the participants to please keep their mobile, uh, keep their devices on mute. Um, if you have any questions, you can write these questions in the chat box. At the end of the session, we will have a question answer session and I will read out your um, question to the presenter. And I can ask you to please unmute yourself and you can ask your question directly from the uh, presenter. So um, let's coming back to our business. So honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as you know that um, INSEEF is organizing um, this research sharing series uh, in collaboration with uh, Knowledge Management Center and alumni office. And today we are going to have six program uh, in this series. Uh, our uh, uh, speaker for today is Dr. Uh, Mohsin Ali, uh, who is a senior lecturer at Monash University, um, Malaysia. And uh, he's going to share his research on the topic, developing a social security micro tacofer model for gig economy workforce. The topic seems very exciting to me. And uh, I think you will have the chance to get more uh, insight over it from the speaker. But before I invite the speaker, I just want to give a brief uh, profile. I want to uh, give a brief profile of the speaker. So uh, currently, Dr. Mohsin Ali is working as a senior lecturer at Monash University, Malaysia. Prior to joining uh, Monash University, Dr. Mohsin was working at Taylor's University, Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mohsin Ali is also an alumni of INSEEF and he started uh, his journey with INSEEF in 2011 by enrolling, enrolling in the program of Chartered Islamic Finance Professional. And uh, then he pursued his PhD with the INSEEF and he graduated in 2017. He is a seasoned uh, academician and he has published various research articles in high-ranking journals uh, like Pacific Basin, Finance Journal, International Review of Economics and Finance, Environmental Science, Pollution Research. And he has gained age index of 12 in Scoopers and 17 in uh, Google Sco Scholar. His areas of research uh, broadly include uh, Islamic finance and banking, the Kaful, sustainability, and uh, Sharia governance. So uh, that's all with the profile of our two days presenter. So I think uh, without any further delay, I would like to uh, request Dr. Mohsin Ali to present his uh, research uh, in the area of uh, developing a social security micro takaful model for gig economy uh, workforce. So kindly I will request Dr. Mohsin to start his presentation. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And um, I'm really happy uh, to be here and to be invited and to share uh, my uh, work on this particular topic. Um, Ibrahim, can you hear us? You said no voice. I hope you he can hear us. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, basically, um, uh, let me uh, you know uh, briefly uh, discuss about myself and before going into the presentation. So um, this research is uh, basically a project which uh, is uh, financed, which was financed by the uh, FRGS grant. If you guys are aware of, especially if there is any academician in the audience. Uh, you might know about this uh, prestigious grant, which is uh, 
uh, you know, I'm highlighting here um, the FRGS grant. So this grant is uh, basically um, every year you have to apply um, and uh, you need to have a fundamental topic uh, where uh, you are looking at some fundamental issues or developing a fundamental model. Um, so um, basically I don't work on fundamental research. Okay, so um, why I'm mentioning this because I see a lot of PhD students in the audience. Uh, so a lot of time, uh, your strength might not be the topic you are working on. So it does not matter at all. What what, what matters is that how you do you get uh, you know, a sport about uh, the topic, whatever you know, uh, tools and uh, techniques you need to use in this particular research. Uh, so how do you you know how can you conduct that? Uh, so for that purpose, um, uh, it doesn't matter really that, uh, of course, it needs to be linked with uh, your area of research, but uh, it does not need to be strictly in, you know, you should not be rigid as a researcher. So um, I have a PhD in Islamic finance, as you guys know, but I mostly work on bank uh, data and bank uh, bank related problems. Um, but this is a one problem which I have been thinking a lot because quite a few of my friends have faced a lot of issues uh, who work in this gig economy. I'll discuss what is gig economy, what does the word gig means as we will go along. Um, uh, so that was the background of uh, this topic. So I generally don't work much on Takaful. And secondly, as it is based on primary data and I generally don't work on primary data research. Uh, so. For that purpose, I would need a team, uh, you know, uh, which has uh, required uh, prereq knowledge of uh, the method and technique which I have wanted to use. So for that uh, specific purpose, I uh, created this 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 team. Uh, so few names might be familiar to you, like Prof. Mehrom and uh, Professor Ziad. Uh, both of them, uh, you know, are very well-renowned scholars in the area of Islamic finance. They you know, uh, they have their own expertise, Ziad, uh, mostly from Sharia point of view, and uh, Prof. Bahram from methodological as well as, uh, you know, uh, economic uh, point of view, right? So, um, um, these, uh, what you call, uh, besides them, uh, I had an RA, so I always write my RA's name on my paper, so Cheng Yenman is, was my RA, and Qasim Ali Nisar is, a, you know, expert in uh, qualitative research, uh, mostly, you know, survey-based research. Uh, I should not call it qualitative, it's survey-based research. And then uh, Professor Hafez uh, is also, like me, works on Scandinavia. So this is the team which I worked on, very experienced researchers, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, different types of backgrounds, which I needed for this particular project. Okay, so this was the introduction of my team, and uh, the sponsor of this uh, project was the uh, Ministry of Higher Education and the grant which I have under. So let us discuss, start, uh, you know, with discussing this, uh, what is gig economy? Um, I, you know, so gig economy, um, if <clears throat> uh, you see the word gig, uh, it got originated from, uh, you know, uh, from musicians, basically. They used to have gigs, you know, where, you know, uh, they, they need to perform at different functions, at different events. So that uh, word they would use that I have a gig in the evening at that train station, for instance. So, so this word was adopted from there. The, that is the origination of the word, the, the word gig. Uh, now, uh, when we use the word gig economy, it refers to uh, labor markets that are short-term, I mean, your contracts are short-term, occasional, uh, on-demand, and mostly task-based. So it is based on demand. It is not a permanent job. It's not a long-term job. It's based on certain projects. So that is what uh, a gig economy refers to. So this particular task could be of one minute, could be of 10 minutes, could be of 20 minutes work, could be of one hour work, could be of a year's work as well, okay? Um, after the uh, 2008 global financial crisis, a lot of cost cutting happened and which basically, uh, you know, impacted the labor market as well, especially in the Western economies. So if you look at the uh, life cycle of any concept, uh, most of the concepts, most of the products basically get developed in the developed market and slowly they move to the developing countries which adopt that concept, which adopt those technologies. Um, another thing which uh, you know uh, happened uh, on site by site uh, after 2008 was the advancement in technology. So people 
uh, were you know um, not getting the contract uh, longer contracts they were looking at more than one types of jobs and uh, different uh, you know uh, gig uh, based uh, you know technologies uh, like uh, or applications or platforms help them you know gaining that um when we talk about uh, the gig economy, so short-term and on-demand jobs are not new phenomena. It's an old phenomena. You know, like we have been having home cleaners for a long time. We have been having agency workers, minicab drivers. So they are all freelancers, right? So it's not something very new, right, in that sense. Uh, but uh, with the advent of technology, a lot of different things have happened. So, um, um, so this word basically overlaps with freelancer, independent workers, non-traditional workers, self-employed, and contingent workers. So these are the different works which are also used for this a particular work, uh, gig economy. Another thing which I wanted to mention uh, earlier um, uh, as well, that what I'm going to cover is not one paper as it was uh, advertised. I wanted to cover... Uh, you know, two uh, papers, and I summarized two papers in this presentation because only then you would be able to relate with a lot of things. Okay, anyways, so technology played a very important role. So applications, uh, you know, uh, which uh, provided the platform to the gig workers, uh, along with the mobile phones in our hands, has actually given it a tremendous push, okay? So these two were the main things, main, uh, you know, accelerators. Um, so actively promote direct matching between providers and customers on a short-term and on-demand basis. So there are platforms like uh, Fiverr, there are platforms like Grab, there are platforms like Food Panda. There are different, different platforms where you can give orders on the basis of your demand and it gets matched with someone who can provide that service, right? So technology basically plays a very, very important role in the gig economy. In contrast, the prior utilization, because I said that this is not a new concept of doing freelancing. We have been having maids and we have been having taxi drivers for long. But the prior utilization of digital platforms for outsourcing or procurement of project work wasn't there. IT was used to diffuse competition, right? So it was not demand-based. Now it is very demand-based and the suppliers are always available. When you open the grab, you can see a lot of drivers around you. Similarly, if you go on Fiverr and you put up a project, you want to build a website, you want some coder to write codes for you. Uh, so there would be a lot of suppliers who will be giving you different quotations and you can choose uh, from them, right? <clears throat> if we classify the... Uh, primary forms of gig work. So basically there are three primary forms of gig work. On-demand physical services, uh, then we have online freelancing, and then there is called crowd work. So this is, uh, these are the three different uh, types of what you call uh, gig work. Uh, in, uh, you know, uh, on-demand physical services type of work is physical. For instance, you need a nurse at home for uh, some elderly. So that's a, a physical service, right? Online freelancing, it's mostly virtual and crowd works are micro tasks. For instance, you are doing event management, you are doing MC in an event. So this is what we want. Location, as we can see, it can be on location, like uh, offline, um, you know, physical, on, or it can be online for the online freelancing and crowd work is online. And uh, task division, it's low at a physical service, online freelancing, it's moderate, crowd work, it could be high. And thus, complexity, it varies for physical work. Online freelancing, it could be very, very complex from writing codes for games to uh, run data and do a data analysis. So different, different type of work can be uh, taken uh, on free, uh, you know, online freelancing. Crowd work, the complexity is relatively low. So what are the common characteristics among these three? The lack of contractual ties between a customer, a middleman, and a requester. So now things have basically improved uh, as far as contracts are con uh, concerned, especially with the advent of the smart contract concept. Uh, but generally, the ties are not so solid as traditional contracts used to be. There is no stamp paper. There is no lawyer involved. It is all on phone, on application. You just click a button and you are basically contractually bound 
and there is a middleman who is trying to you know take you know taking care of the uh, you know interests of both parties then it's a tri party labor framework comprises a client middleman and a requester which is unique in its nature uh, then we have short term assignments or missions uh, and lastly these three types of gig work offer piece rate pay mean per piece per piece mean if you are writing a, a code for some game so it is for that game it, if you are delivering food it is for that drive uh, you know taking grab so these are all piece a uh, pieces for which you are getting paid right moving on so why uh, i'm 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 explaining this because different people have different uh, understanding of what is the work what is the economy so it is very important to really understand uh, what it is and really understand what the problem uh, here is okay so when we discuss this that this is the, this is what gig work is and i'll show you the numbers of how many people are getting involved in this type of work and you will be uh, surprised uh, probably surprised um, it is very different very 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 different type of uh, work as compared to the long term employment uh in long term employment contracts there are a lot of things which are certain uh what are things which are certain your salary is certain you can you know take leaves you can have you know days off um uh, so the gig work does not provide these benefits and protections typically provided in full employment which exposes them to more risks so a traditional employee like me um you know a government servant or as uh, someone who is working in a shop on a monthly basis or a waiter in the restaurant the risks associated with these contractual long term contractual employments are different from this short term uh, gig work so these risks are not protected by government schemes traditional insurance provided and creating a significant insurance and protection gap for gap for gig work so this is the problem state there is relatively no um or very 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 few products available for these type of workers uh, there are no government schemes which are basically directly targeting them uh, you know uh, providing them uh, support um there has been some initiatives from the government uh, providing general policies for the b40 which is bottom 40 of the economy but coverage is limited for gig workers and mostly it is uh, you know voluntary basis and um secondly uh, there is another problem with this uh, we will discuss later on about awareness right so this study aims to identify the unique risks and other uh, reasons for the low insurance penetrations among the gig economy workforce okay <clears throat> <clears throat> so the gig economy leaves a significant insurance and protection gap for workers so there is right now if you go to any insurance company they will provide you ready made products gig economy or gig workers need tailor made products they need tailor made models okay so current you know insurance industry does not provide them any solution micro the kaful provides a solution by covering unique risks and reducing the burden on the government so what solution we are going to provide using micro the kaful model uh is uh, something which uh, can help covering unique risks taking into consideration all the aspects which we have uh, found in our research and uh, provide a doable feasible uh, solution the research constructs a viable social security microcaffel model for the gig economy workforce and the microcaffel model aligns with the 12th millennium plan and sdgs by providing affordable health enhancing public safety and security improving digital economy Uh, increasing halal traceability and promoting income equality so basically when you improve the the kaful penetration in a country especially to those people who have been neglected those who are not in the uh, greater scheme of uh, you know insurance companies they are uh, you know uh, they they their needs are not met so if the product is targeted to these type of people it will increase the penetration in the market which would decrease the dependence on the government it will increase their uh, you know uh, solving their uh, the chances of solving their health problems it enhances their safety and security of course it will be done through digital economy 
halal visibility will improve and of course the income equality uh, will get promoted so basically uh, that is where we see uh, that this model can help uh, you know moving on <clears throat> Okay, so uh, protection of gig workers, what are the different risks? You might be thinking, what are the different risks which they are facing? Uh, so first of all, from health point of view, there are a lot of physical risks. Right? A normal grab or delivery boy is, uh, driver or delivery boy is uh, facing as compared to any, uh, you know, sort of permanent uh, job guy, right? Uh, nowadays, uh, the companies like Grab uh, and Driver, they are providing some sort of insurance to their drivers, uh, but still it is not enough uh, to take into consideration about of uh, their overall physical health. Okay, when I say overall physical health means when someone is going to drive for eight hours, 10 hours a day, accident is not the only thing he needs to be insured about. He needs to be insured about if he is having back pain he would not be able to drive tomorrow and what will happen to his income for tomorrow. So there is no income which is, uh, you know, uh, covered by the uh, insurance companies, All right? Similarly, a lot of good work is done on laptops, right? People spend hours and hours. Studies have found that it has increased the mental health issues among the, especially among the IT workers who are gig workers working at home, the light is not nice. They are they don't have awareness of how long they should sit and how long they should not sit. Plus, the culture in the IT uh, world, especially in the gig world, the freelancing world, is to work for longer hours, work at nights. Their sleeps are disturbed and all that. So it causes mental issues. There have been no direct insurance product to cover these type of mental problems which are directly linked with the gig work, physical problems which are directly linked with the gig work, right? A traditional jobs do not have, they would have some sort of physical issues, definitely. But if you talk about uh, factories where people are working and they have physical constraints or physical risks, most of the times factories cover those risks, right? As far as mental health is concerned, in a nine to five job, you have a choice to work only for nine to five, right? Here in a gig work environment, because your job is not secure, people feel unsecure, whatever work they get, they overcommit, right? Because their uh, you know, income is not guaranteed, right? So that is where they are feeling a lot of you know, uh, mental health issues as well uh, because of the nature of the job of gig workers. So um, income... Um, of gig workers is directly linked with these risks, which are mental health issues and physical health issues. So is there any, you know, uh, the carpool for their income as well? So would the income be covered if a grab driver would not be able to work due to a genuine physical or mental health issue? So we are looking at these risks as, right? So uh, we wanted to provide a flexible model because as far as income is concerned, keep in mind that the income of gig workers is not constant. Their income is variable. So unlike traditional insurance products where you have to pay premium every month or every year, in, in uh, gig workers cannot afford to pay that. They can only pay when they earn, right? So we need to have a flexible model which affect, which accepts premium or the payments for the couple product uh, at flexible basis. And then, uh, you know, awareness among the gig workers about the risks they are, you know, taking due to gig work. Um, and the need of insurance is also something which uh, is of an important uh, concern, right? Moving on, if we talk about literature, uh, Patel 2007 argues that insurance is not just a felt need, but a real need for the poor. So why we are using the word poor uh, is that gig work is not only for poor. Rather, if we talk about the income being generated by gig work, maybe the percentage of income is more inclined towards the uh, rich uh, people who can afford to have better tools and equipments to do gig work. But since we, for this particular project, we are more concerned about those gig workers who fall in the B40 category. And there are a lot in Malaysia. I'll show you some numbers in a while. 
Uh, Brown 2001 suggests that exposure is not necessarily the only reason for demand for insurance. Exposure means how much you are exposed how, to different risks, as affordability and awareness are also important. So Brown says, on top of the exposure, the risks, there are two other factors, which is affordability and awareness. Studies show that the gig economy workforce is growing and consists of young workers who may be less aware of their exposures and risks. So there are different uh, people who might not be, that's why awareness is a big concern as well. Then if we talk about um, um, income related risks are prevalent for gig workers, including wage theft, lack of workers' compensation, and no income replacement or unemployment insurance. As I was mentioning, there is no takaful for their uh, unemployment. There is no income replacement if they are, cannot do some work due to some health issues, due to some uh, matter, they would not be get paid. There is, you know, and because the contractual like, contracts are not as sol solid as traditional contracts are. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So um, there is there are a lot of instances of lack of workers' compensation as well. Both offline and online gig work are prone to health and safety hazards with little regulatory framework to prevent. So the problem from regulatory side is also there that there have not been enough regulations for gig workers. There is a reason why there are not enough because there is no standardization of gig. Different people do gig work differently and there are different types of gigs. Micro insurance needs for the gig economy workforce primarily include coverage of basic health care costs death of the main family, breadwinner, and property rules. So this has been currently whatever micro-insurances are provided. When we talk about gig economy in Malaysia, it's growing very fastly, um, especially after COVID-19. So before COVID-19, the percentages were around 20 to 30% growth rate I'm talking about. In COVID-19, a lot of people lost jobs because of, uh, you know, uh, the lockdowns, uh, movement constraints. Many people from M40 had to move to B40. For those who are foreigners and are not uh, aware of these terms, M40 mean, means middle 40% of Malaysian uh, population, and B40 means bottom 40% of um, you know, Malaysian economy or Malaysian population and T40 is uh, T20, the remaining T20 is the top 20. So with the advent of technology, so during COVID, we have seen, we have moved to Zoom meetings, we have moved to different, uh, you know, uh, what you call uh, platforms, different applications uh, came into existence. So it helped the growth even more. In 2021 figures, there were 4 million freelancing individuals in Malaysia. How much is the population of Malaysia? Above 32 million. So at least 4 million. 4 million means one eighth of the Malaysian population is involved. And they are registered as freelancers. According to 2019 EPF investigation, around 40% of Malaysian workers will be self-employed within the next five years. Means 2024, next year, by next year, the study, they, they, they suspected that around 40% of the Malaysians would be self-employed. There was a um, uh, policy note uh, called Digital Malaysia 2012, uh, which basically helped, so it's very closely linked with that as well, uh, to promote micro-sourcing for B40s, to help them get micro-works, which, uh, you know, can you know, can help increase their income levels. So Digital Malaysia 2012 uh, has basically been accelerated through COVID-19 as well. And if we see the Malaysian 12 plan, uh, it, it is it also talks about uh, digitalization of different services and how B40s can be indulged into that. In 2015, uh, there uh, came a policy document by Ministry of higher education. Uh, so entrepreneurial minds uh, were capable of acting as job creators. So that is what they want to create. So they want to create those people who can create jobs. Right. So entrepreneurial mindset. So which basically uh, gives rise to the trend of gig economy in Malaysia. And that's why EPF investigation suggested that around 40% of the Malaysian would be doing self-work, self-employed 
will be self-employed by 2024. As far as this study is concerned, what I'm going to show you now is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, my throat is really bad. <clears throat> Just give me a second, I'll get a glass of water. In the meantime, uh, participants, if you have any question, you can write in the chat box. Okay, so um, I'll just uh, quickly. Now, first, uh, we have a question in the chat box. If you like to take, yeah, uh, I'll, I have read the question, uh, but I, I'll respond to it uh, because I have to show the model first, and then I'll respond to that. Okay, don't worry, I'll respond to that in that then, right? Okay, I've seen the question, and uh, please keep writing the questions. I'll respond to all of them at the end, right? Okay. So quickly, um, uh, basically, uh, as far as the methodology is concerned, so um, we have employed, uh, you know, quantitative method as well as uh, some um, qualitative approach uh, for developing the, the, mo the model. Quantitative method is specifically to look at the different types of risks, which are linked with, uh, you know, uh, what you call uh, uh, protection, why people do not take protection, what are the reasons people don't take protection, and increasing those things, how can that help in, you know, uh, enhancing the protection, right? So these are the, um, so, uh, sorry. Uh, so here we see, um, you know, uh, we have done a survey on 374 respondents from different states of Malaysia. Um, and uh, we have employed the model called uh, partially square structural equation modeling and a multivariate statistical analysis approach, uh, which facilitates the theory building and testing and uh, different type of relationships. <clears throat> so this was the basic model which we used uh, that how awareness, loss exposure and financial capacity uh, impact the protection. When we talk about awareness, how many, how much people are aware of their need of insurance. Loss exposure is what are the different risks they are exposed to so the level of loss exposure and the financial capacity, whether they can afford the uh, protection or not, right? So this, this is a, a very basic, uh, not basic summarized table of uh, all these three. Um, uh, so what we found is that we found that um, awareness, loss exposure and financial capacity, all three support the decision means uh, in improving these three or when the awareness increases, people go for uh, protection. When the risks increase, they go for protection. And when their affordability increases, they go for protection, right? Uh, this is the model. If uh, you can uh, see the, if you are aware of uh, how the structural equation modeling works. So if you can see um, uh, over 
dependent variable, which is protection, is here. And we have um, three main IVs, which is uh, loss exposure, awareness, and financial capacity. Financial capacity is further, uh, you know, uh, measured by uh, the uh, ability to manage money, uh, planning ahead, choosing financial products, and staying informed. So these were the different variables. So uh, this is what we got from literature. We developed a whole questionnaire based on five liquid square, and uh, we uh, asked the questions, and uh, you know, we gave this from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And uh, so uh, here we can see different coefficients, and uh, you know, we can see you know uh, what type of relationship we can uh, make out from here. So all three variables uh, seem to be significant and very important for uh, the protection work, right? So this was one part of the study to really analyze what was the reason, what is the reason why these gig workers are not taking the um, the 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 uh, what you call uh, the conventional uh, insurance or the gaffle product. Um, besides the closed-ended questions, we also asked some open-ended questions. Uh, to seek their opinion on different things, to look at what are the different types of risks they are, uh, you know, engaged with, so which which we have like, documented in our report. So all these three awareness, loss, exposure over three hypotheses, all three were supported, and you know uh, we found them to be very very important for this. So I won't uh, spend much time on this. I want to show you the model. So this is the model which we thought. Um, here it is, uh, you know, a basic model because there is. Uh, an actuarial model, which I want to work on, for which I need uh, some more funding as well to, you know, uh, work on that, especially with respect to um, analyzing the risks. But currently, to solve the problems of uh, flexible in uh, flexible income, uh, this uh, flexible not variable income, uh, to solve the problem of uh, you know uh, different types of risks associated with their mental and uh, physical health, and uh, you know um, uh, the, the the problem of the breadwinner losing their uh, you know um, limb or you know lost their life so how it affects the whole family so basically covering these 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 main risks so if you look at this couple model uh, we have uh, participants participants are basically gig workers we need a, some government support government gives a separate budget for b4 right some of that if it gets channeled through this uh, what you call um, uh, this 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 uh, thing uh, this this model the micro insurance product so we need the subsidy fund to uh, basically cover the uh, risks associated with this right because you see when the risks in, increase uh, it's a basic finance principle and actuarials uh, actuarial science we basically go in detail and look at the different seismics of this particular model and look at the different risks and try to price the gig work cannot be standardized so different types of risks need to be priced separately right so um, most of the times the risks are so high that the, the the premium or the contribution needs to be very high as well. That's where government subsidy is very important. The reason being why should government subsidize this is that if they don't subsidize it, the risk is bound to happen, right? There is a percentage of risk. There is a percentage of chance. There, there's a chance of occurrence of an event, right? If that event happens, the person will be burdened on the government. And that could be uh, you know, uh, very difficult to manage for the government. Instead, if, if it could be channeled through a proper channel, which is, uh, you know, micro insurance product, then um, the subsidy fund could help a lot. Then we have donations, works, and grants fund, uh, which is a charitable trust fund, which would, uh, which we uh, will have, um, uh, you know, uh, linked with the main the couple product. Uh, where made the couple company uh, because they all always have this uh, work and grants and uh, donations. If you look at any the couple company, so if this model is adopted by the couple company, that those donations, works and grants, which they you know channel out and they are not sure whether they have been used properly or not, it can be used in a proper way to certain type of customers, which basically fall under B four ticket again, right? So from this uh, initial expenses and uh, Dr. Uh, Mohan, uh, just to interrupt you, if you don't mind, may I ask a question? Who is this? I'm Sorry. Kashifa. Ka Kashifa, if you can just, I'm just concluding quickly. Okay, then um, I'll take the question. Okay, because um, uh, let me just finish this and then uh, I'll quickly take the question. Okay, um, uh, because this is, I think, second last slide and next one is the last slide. Okay, Sorry, Kashifa. Okay, 
So, um, and then uh, there is a contribution from the participants. Um, there is a cooperative common pool, which we have here, uh, which will have uh, whatever is uh, taken from subsidy fund, a charitable fund, whatever is the surplus, it will move to this uh, cooperative common pool. Any operating expenses, fees will be paid from this, whatever is left will be basically uh, will be considered as policy benefit for, for the participants. So this premium will be based on different type of risks, for instance, and different type of uh, you know incomes which are available there. And it will be completely flexible uh, depending on the variable income uh, people are having. So uh, we uh, try to, uh, you know, in, in, in our detailed uh, report, which is not part of the paper, um, we have basically tried to divide uh, the types of risks uh, and we have tried to create around 30 uh, different types of gig works and try to show like, you know, uh, different type of gig works, try to correct, uh, categorize them in these 30 categories, like if it's a driver, bike driver, car driver, what type of risks can, can be associated with them and what type of uh, premiums they would have to pay. So these premiums would not be fixed on a monthly basis. They would be variable based on the income. And uh, uh, we would not look at the uh, short-term based of contribution payment. We would look at the long-term base of contribution payment. So if someone is not paying in a month, two months, three months, four months, even then it is fine. But if we, if we look at the one year to two year time period, and the payment is not up to the mark, to the average income without a proper reason, then it is a matter of concern, right? So this is how we have tried to uh, come up with the uh, contribution. It's not fixed for everyone, okay? Uh, quickly, uh, what are the recommendations and conclusion? Um, uh, if we talk about uh, recommendation um, and conclusion, so we basically came up with this uh, micro scaffold model to help gig workers protect themselves from unique and general risks they face. Um, this is very important to understand the unique risks for the stakeholders, including gig workers, regulators, and industry players. So proposed model will reduce the dependence on the government and help government meet the sustainable development goals as well. Government intervention is super, super, super important from regulatory point of view because of their, uh, you know, very uh, weak nature of contractual obligations on both sides. We see a lot of problems so that is where government needs to regulate this thing as well. And uh, we need um, uh, some subsidies, grants from the government for this particular product as well. Uh, society support, because these gig workers are part of the society, especially the B40. Uh, so society support does not need to be direct support. Uh, whatever the couple companies um, uh, having, uh, you know, their the couple funds and uh, they are all, all have the donation fund from that particular thing that can be, you know, uh, moved towards micro insurance and especially uh, for those B40s who are facing these risks. Because at the end of the day, the CAFL is a charitable contract. It's not uh, insurance like, you know, dual contracts, it's a unilateral charitable contract. Uh, so where, uh, you know, uh, society's obligation also falls in place uh, to, uh, you know, uh, share some of the risk which B40s are taking uh, to support the economy. Okay, so that's all from my side. Now I'll take the questions. Um, okay, let me just open the. Thank model. you so much, uh, Dr. Mawson, for your insightful presentation. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Sub can uh, answer the questions. And in the meantime, if any participant want to ask any question, they can unmute and ask that doctor directly. Okay, so first of all, uh, there is a question by Hussain, I guess. What difference this model between personal scaffold protection, income protection, are they eligible to sign up? So the model which we are proposing, um, first of all, we are looking at only gig, those gig workers uh, who have problems in, you know, uh, problems in adopting the traditional scaffold model. Why would someone not adopt a th traditional Takaful model? Someone would not adopt a traditional Takaful model because he has a variable income. One. Second, he is not aware or is scared of the uh, uh, you know, obligations he has in a traditional contract, right? So this is a very flexible tailor-made contract which can be easily uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, altered as per the needs of uh, people. So all the gig workers, which are from B40 category, uh, who cannot take 
the uh, who are not able to take the uh, you know uh, traditional tagafal products uh, or, or their risks uh, one of the major reason uh, even that uh, traditional tagafal companies do not uh, take these customers because the risks associated with their works which is required to be covered these tagafal companies are not willing to take that or they are asking for a very high premium for this particular case okay so this was for Hussain, and uh, then we have uh, Reena. Um, so how is the scheme of micro takaful and who can provide micro takaful the government or worker union? Oh, very good question. So it can be government uh, who uh, takes an initiative and provides this type of scheme. Government has come up with the SOXO uh, plan. So micro insurance can be, uh, you know, developed. Uh, but the, for, for that, there is a lot of work needs to be done. Uh, to uh, basically look at the different categories of the gig work and then analyze their risks and set the premium accordingly. So uh, governments can do that. I don't think worker unions uh, will be able to do that because of the expertise and the risks associated with this. I think the normal takaful companies can have their own micro insurance products or micro takaful products where it is linked with them or there could be a separate micro takaful company. Uh, what I'm trying to pitch is to, uh, you know, uh, traditional takaful companies to have their micro takaful business as well, so that their uh, donation uh, fund can be linked with the micro takaful product as well. So government can do as well, as well as uh, the uh, takaful companies. Uh, worker unions, I don't think they would have a capacity to uh, cover those risks, which we are trying to cover. They are already covering the risks which are related to accidents, like Grab uh, is covering for their drivers, but they are mostly linked with the only the accidents not looking at the other types of risk associated with that specific job okay yeah kashwar now what, what was your question sorry uh, actually i got the answer basically i was uh, thinking uh, this gig economy is not uh, you know expanding in other countries also like in Pakistan, there are many people who are also working as freelancers and they prefer to work through this more. So, uh, but uh, the element of government support, uh, like in Malaysia, may be missing in Pakistan. So I think uh, the other thing you said, like uh, the insurance companies can do their own, can be a solution because I think government subsidy would be, uh, 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 apart from this, uh, uh, what is the incentive for government? Uh, uh, for this micro so, model for supporting so, this yeah so very very good question what is the what is there for the government why would government subsidize this right so if you uh, know uh, like in the last government in pakistan for instance they came up with the health card why did they come up with the health card because at the end of the day uh, you know when you do not manage these risks or cover these risks in a in a in a proper manner uh, they fell on the government. So you would go uh, to Pakistan and see any government hospital and you can see the condition over there, right? So they are overburdened because they are mismanaged, primarily because of mismanaged, not because of the resources. It is primarily mismanagement of the resources. Government would subsidize, so because government is going to spend it, spend money anyway, why not spend in a proper way, in a through a proper channel? <laughs> Excuse me, through a proper channel through micro insurance products where people would be registered with you, you know them, you know their risks associated with them, and then provide subsidy for that particular risk so they would not be a burden on the government later on. And they would be paying their own premiums as well, um, ultimately, and then there will be uh, part from different financial institutions, like in Pakistan, almost all the banks have bank at the kafir, right? So all these banks, um, uh, all these banks also have donation funds, which is huge. And if you see, I, I actually wrote a paper on this, but I couldn't finalize uh, this. That how mismanaged is that donation fund? It's a huge donation fund of every Islamic bank in different countries of the world, and it is grossly mismanaged. It is given um, uh, it, uh, that the money which is in that donation fund is not prioritized to be given to the lowest of the economy. And it is given, you know, just as scholarships to the students who might be deserving in some sense. But there are people who are in more need, um, you know, in the in in, in the uh, in, in, in that particular country or in the particular economy. Uh, so it provides a good avenue to use that donation fund. As well. So that's why it is one of the pre-recommendation that you have to be from the B40 of the economy. If you are in the T20, you can go for any other, uh, you know. 
Yeah, uh, Hossein, you're right. Uh, mycelium protection, the problem with the mycelium protection is um, um, I have gone through the that one. It's a voluntary protection. Um, the problem with the mycelium protection is um, what I understood based on my questions from uh, the uh, the questions which I asked from the uh, the, the the different gig workers. Uh, they were not even aware of what benefits can it provide. Uh, they were not. Yeah, they they were thinking that it's not something very serious. It's not marketed properly. It's a voluntary scheme. Um, and uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the 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 uh, what you call uh, the coverage is not, you know, the the, in, uh, the the coverage with respect to the income uh, part of this that what uh, the uh, income replacement part part of this is not provided over there. So these are something. So uh, my salam can take it as a definitely, uh, you know, uh, as an additional feature. Uh, definitely, that that could be one way. Uh, yeah, there is another question. Are micro farmers included in the gig economy? Yeah, if my if, as far as my understanding is concerned, um, actually, when we talk about gig economy in the more modern scheme of things, it is basically uh, on demand based work, right? So micro farmers generally do not provide uh, uh, you know on demand based work. But if we look at, uh, so it doesn't mean, because the gig economy doesn't have a, you know, a two plus two equal to four type of definition. Like it's a, it, it's not a very concrete definition. The boundaries are very blurred. So um, the micro farmers have also have unique types of risks, which bigger farmers do not have. Uh, they do not have diversification. They do not have but I didn't think about it. And now, since we have asked about these micro farmers, I personally would count them uh, in the gig economy as well. Uh, though, uh, strictly speaking, from the own demand point of view, which is one of the main characteristics of the gig work, they don't fall in that category. Uh, but from the protection point of view, because our main objective is not to serve only to the gig economy. Again, this is one part of the economy which is suffering. So that's why we took it. But micro farmers can be included, and the micro the government can be provided to them. So, agricultural insurance products are already available. This is again a big uh, awareness problem. Uh, you can even insure cows. You can even insure your crop, even at a micro level. So there are agricultural insurance products already available for, and micro farmers can easily take that those products as well. And uh, they are, if I'm not mistaken, um, because I, I didn't study about it for last since four or five years, but five years ago, I read a report um, and where government subsidizes the agriculture, you know, uh, insurance products. So there are already uh, insurance products there. So if there are some risks which are associated, which we need to study, if there are some risks which are associated to micro farmers and not being co covered by agriculture insurance, then definitely uh, they can be taken into, uh, you know, our scheme of things. Another question is from Abdul Rashi. So mm -hmm. is there a retakaful cover for these schemes? How long should subsidies last? How are you promoting governance under these schemes? Oh, very good question. Uh, <clears throat> so these are very... Uh, so first question is about read the curve. Um, okay, how to answer this? Uh, this is a pain point. Um, so uh, the problem with the read the kaful thing is if you guys know, uh, the read the kaful companies are just like reinsurance companies. Um, as far as uh, my research is concerned, uh, when I asked from some industry experts, um, Read the couple companies might not be willing to. This is a suspicion. Huh? This is um, not tested yet. Uh, they might not be willing to buy these risks. You know what read the couple companies do, right? The couple companies or insurance companies buy your risk. Basically, insurance companies, the couple companies shared your your risk, and then this risk is shared by read the couple. Companies. They might not be willing to share this these type of risks. Which are uh, so that is where government subsidy becomes very. This is the main reason. Other, if the the re, re the couple companies could come in 
I uh, would not have proposed the government subsidy. Uh, this is one of the main reason where um, I think government intervention uh, is very important because I, well, as for my research, uh, read the couple companies might not be willing to uh, share these type of unique risks because they are mostly in the business of uh, managing the traditional type of uh, you know uh, risks. Thank you so, so much. Is, second Abdul question was yeah. Second about question provider. was like. Yeah, so creating awareness. Uh, sorry, come again. Uh, the second question is regarding uh, how are you creating awareness, promoting client value, and an understandable marketing communication in customer centric way? Okay, so uh, this is a marketing question. Um, uh, we uh, uh, we just proposed some ways to have road shows, and you know, uh, I personally went on and discussed. Uh, with uh, gig workers on the streets, um, gig workers like, you know, bike drivers uh, in different states uh, from Perak to Pahang to uh, Kada to uh, what you call uh, Penang, Johor. I personally went and discussed with them the, their issues and all that. Um, so uh, one of the uh, easiest or fastest way is they have their own groups, especially the B40ones. They have WhatsApp groups or Telegram groups for Grab drivers for a different type of uh, delivery services. Mm -hmm. As far as, uh, as also the physical uh, work pro, like the maids and all that, they also have their um, uh, things. Even, you know, uh, coders, they also have their own online groups and Facebook pages. So that is one of the main. So we have to use technology to market this. This is very, very important. To market, we have to use technology. What is the main source for them to get the business should be the main source for marketing as well and easiest way to approach them okay and um, believe you me when i discuss this model with them um, more than 70 to 80 percent people said uh, wanted to have uh, some way of uh, you know coverage of their risks uh, because of a lot of uncertainty in their work and a lot of uh, you know um, health related problems associated with them with the work which is not covered by the traditional products so this is uh, what uh, we have proposed so using technology for uh, marketing uh, purposes one uh, one question was asked uh, which was a supplementary question in the last one uh, about the governance so governance would not be very different um, uh, again uh, the model which i uh, proposed here is a cooperative model which is not a very famous model in Malaysia. <laughs> so it's a model which uh, is uh, being used in Pakistan and uh, in uh, some uh, couple of uh, companies in Gulf are also using the cooperative model. Uh, uh, primarily because this cooperative model allows you to have, uh, you know, gig worker representatives part of the trust board uh, as well. So the, the trustee, uh, the, the, the conventional uh, trust uh, would be created, uh, the cooperative would be created, so which would have uh, the, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, people from, uh, you know, different stakeholders, uh, so representation from different stakeholders, especially from the gig workers, uh, to uh, look after the, uh, you know, interests of, uh, of these parties. Um, so that, that is where, uh, you know, um, I was uh, more, you know, uh, concerned because here, we are not looking at the Mudarba model where we can make profits or use the surpluses. Uh, because of the risks associated here, we are just uh, focused currently on the, uh, you know, uh, covering those risks and uh, not, you know, having surpluses or even if there are surpluses, uh, that would be utilized for the next year. Because I have, as I discussed earlier, there would be varied payments from uh, different uh, gig workers. Mm. Yeah, there is an other uh, question. So the question is, how much of quantitative and qualitative research is shaping client value, client experience? Is there a national survey highlight all issues, needs, wants, obstacles, and preferences? Have you conducted a pilot? How was the outcome? Okay, so... Okay, so basically, uh, you know, um, how does this FRGS works is, uh, so uh, I, we have not conducted any pilot. It is, uh, uh, it is basically because I got a grant in 2020 October. 
and um, you see uh, it was uh, in the middle of covid and um, for one year i couldn't do anything uh, it was just doing online research doing literature review more than a year so whatever research i have done I, we have to you know take stuff. i could not find an ra for longer period of my project as well so we could not run any any pilot as yet uh, but that's what uh, we are thinking and we are applying for another grant to you know do pilot uh, research on you know uh, implementing it uh, as a pilot product and seeing uh, what is the uh, you know uh, how how market uh, it is for now it is just a proposed model uh, unfortunately we have not conducted the uh, the, the market study um, the first part of the question was how much Qualitative and quantitative. Can you please repeat? Qualitative and quantitative research shape client value. Uh, is this question specific to uh, this particular um, uh, yeah, study yeah. or it's a general question? He's just asking you regarding this. So, so like it's, it, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's a general question. Um, how, uh, how are you using qualitative and quantitative data? Um, research to shape client value. So uh, what is client value? Or what do you understand by client so, value? So client value is, so your clients already have existing coping mechanism that they use in mitigating their risk, whether they're informal or not. And so client value is that thing that will make them leave their existing coping mechanism to go to your formal proposition. So they see it as responsive. There is no so existing formal or informal example, mechanism. So, for example, they see it as very responsive. They see it as simple. They see it as appropriate, attending to their priority needs. And they see it um, as a product that takes into consideration their nuances. So, for example, if you are Muslim, um, you know that the burial is um, immediate. And so you can receive... Um, in place of a death certificate, a note from the imam. So things like that, if the person died in a village and at home. So that's what I mean by client value. So for me, uh, what client value basically means is that where, whether we are providing any value addition to the gig workers, right? So gig workers is the target market. Uh, so whether we are providing any value addition uh, in terms of managing their risk. For that purpose, very purpose, we have conducted the survey, which is uh, considered, people think it's a qualitative research. No, it's not a qualitative, it's a quantitative. So uh, the data which we collect from the survey is basically a quantitative research to understand what are the risks associated with them, to understand what are the problems they are facing and what is stopping them to get into the formal, the careful uh, products, right? So by solving these things, I think we can add value uh, to the proposition and uh, that is uh, our main purpose. Uh, how much is, the, how much, when we use the word, how much it's a percentage term, that how much of the qualitative and quantitative. So I cannot give you the percentage on this, that how much of this is this and how much is this of that. But uh, uh, that is how we use the research. So the tools are just a medium to understand the problems. And the qualitative research is mostly used to come up with this. We have conducted a lot of interviews uh, with the industry experts, see, seeing what are the you know intricacies in the industry, why traditional industry is not looking at this big market. So and only then we look at the different problems being faced by them and then come up with this, uh, you know, thing. So qualitative methods, um, unfortunately, are not taught at NCIF as well. Even the quantitative are mostly empirical and they are not survey based, which we study. So that is also my uh, main uh, area. I, I do more empirical studies and not these type of studies. So um, um, I, I think that is that that is my my response. If it makes any sense to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Mosin. Uh, if any of the participants are left with any question, we can take one more question uh, because I think we have uh, uh, reached to the end of the today's session. So if anyone has any question. Okay, it seems that we have come to the conclusion of our today's session. I will request all the participants to just 
turn on their camera for a quick photo session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Mohsin Ali. And I would like to thank all the participants who have made this session really an interactive session. And I hope to see you soon, inshallah, with the next INSEEF research sharing series. Till then, um, thank you. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Just, just one thing. Uh, so um, I am grateful for inviting me and sharing uh, this session with, uh, with, with the students. Uh, I see mostly students and which makes me um, more interested. Uh, so I would, um, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, discuss with the brother Hanif. Uh, I would love to come on campus and because most of you, I'm sure doing a quantitative study. And I think it would be more helpful if we can uh, do, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll suggest a topic uh, on sustainability. Uh, so we can, you know, uh, it, it'll help students a lot uh, with respect to their especially PhD research. So some somewhere in next year we'll, we'll we can plan that uh, early next year. So I, I would love to come again and uh, meet all of you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity again, brother. Thank, thank you again. so much, Dr. Mohsin Ali, and thank you all the participants once again. Thank you so much.